Hello, this is Lauren Carr, and welcome to Authors on iTours, a podcast devoted to authors, book bloggers, and other book lovers alike. Hello, welcome to Authors on iTours. Today, we are interviewing Roberta K. Fernandez, the author of A Knock on the Door. In her 63 years of life, Roberta Fernandez, a board-certified hypnotist, didn't know that she had a story waiting to be told. In 2006, she attended a week-long memoir writing class conducted by a best-selling author, Joyce Maynard. Joyce worked hard to bring out Roberta's best work in spite of her self-perceived lack of talent. While it was an awesome experience to be instructed by a well-known author, Roberta determined that writing about herself was not a talent she possessed. As a first-time author, Roberta now understands she was simply destined to write in a different genre. She enjoys creating relatable characters and watching the story unfolds as she types. Like her readers, she wonders what's going to happen next. A sequel is already being written as this book is being published. Who knows what words will flow across the page in the next 15 years. So now, without any further ado, let's talk with Roberta K. Fernandez, the author of A Knock on the Door. It's a series, um, and it just came to me. The third book will also involve the same characters. Um, the ones that survive anyway. Um, so, um, but a knock on the door, I'm sorry, you asked me what it's about. I guess I should tell you. (laughs) So it is a thriller. Um, and it is about two very strong women. Um, I really wanted women characters. I wanted older women characters. You know, when you look at all the, I mean, there are very successful women writers in this genre, but the ones that seem to get most of the attention are like the Browns and the Baldacci's, right? Mm-hmm. And so I wanted strong women characters that were older. And um, when I worked with the publicizer people, I had to research the genre and come with marketing ideas and know who my audience was and all of that. It was really good education for me in working that way with them. And, you know, the average reader, like 50% of the readers, 55, I think it is, 55% of the readers in the genre are women, 40 mm-hmm. to 60. And so my characters are in their 40s and their 60s. And um, so it, it it is just this story about privacy, which is ironic that that is so much in the news again. Mm-hmm. Uh, Actually, in May of this year, um, ICE uh, basically stole the concept of my book. Um, oh. they're, actually, they're actually doing it. And I would like to say, oh, maybe they got the idea from me, but my book was at the printer at the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so no, they didn't read my book and say, okay. oh, well, let's do this. <laughs> But, um, you know, it is around this idea of privacy. So it is really in the news again. Um, But the book takes place in 2015. And basically, Lori Crawford, uh, her husband's killed in a car accident, a single car accident. And his assistant, Rita, who is in her 60s, um, comes across something at work that leads her to believe that his death was not an accident. Mm -hmm. And she eventually does some legwork and finds out that uh, it was indeed not an accident and gets in touch with Lori. And they they become part of the plot. They get put on the hit list. And the whole thing is, can they bring down the director of the NSA? Because he's Mm -hmm. behind it all. So here's two average citizens that show courage for standing up for what they believe that there should be justice. Um, And it's just, yeah, the book just unfolds. It's very fast paced. I write like I like to read. Mm -hmm. I like short chapters. I like, you know, like, oh, what's gonna happen? Um, Probably the most consistent comment I'm getting about the book is that it was just one more chapter. Oh no, one more chapter. Oh no, one more (laughs) chapter. And then it's like two o'clock in the morning, right? Um, so, uh, that's been 
like the biggest complaint about the book so far because <laughs> I just couldn't put it down. So uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, who knows? I, I, you can't judge, I don't think objectively what you write. Mm. Um, I feel like- Yeah, it's like your baby. It it's is like your baby. baby. And I feel like the, I, I realize that um, when the reviews started coming in from NetGalley, that's when I finally accepted that, hey, I think I am an author, right? Like mm -hmm. these are not people that know and love me. They're not people that, you know, I'm connected with on LinkedIn or wherever some of these people on my list are from, right? Mm -hmm. um, that just want to support an author. These are people that got a copy of my book that do this, you know, because they love it. And for, I don't know, for a living, I don't know, but for enjoyment anyway, and they don't know me at all. And there's no skin in the game to give me a good review. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, when that, when they started coming in and they were saying, I really love this book. Now I feel like an author. About your book. And I'd like to hear about your journey to becoming an author, because you didn't start writing this book back, you know, a long time ago, you, you, you became a journalist, you know, do you want to say what age you were when you started this book? What what 64. got you into this? <laughs> 64. Yeah, 64. I'm be, well, actually probably 63 when I started the book, but um, um, I'm 64 this year. I'll be 65 in January. So yeah, I'm, I'm late in the game for sure. Uh, never pegged myself as an author. I honestly can't tell you where this book came from. Um, I am a hypnotist. And it was during COVID and I practiced self-hypnosis every day. And it was like, you should, you should write this book. And so about 15 years ago, I want to say, um, I've had this long-term relationship with a writer, Joyce Maynard. Um, and she's, Joyce has probably written 20 books. A couple of them have become movies. And years ago, I was going through a divorce, not in a really good place. And she's like, you should come to my memoir writing camp in Guatemala. And I'm like, Joyce, I'm, I'm not a writer. You know, I've, I've followed your work. And every time she would be in town, she, you know, had a list and she would call and say, oh, I really want to meet you. Come to my signing. And so anyway, <laughs> I went to Guatemala for a week and decided I was definitely not a memoir writer. <laughs> I like writing about myself. Didn't consider myself a writer, but I had a great time. And it was a wonderful experience that quite honestly changed my life on a personal level. And so um, it gave me the confidence to write for business because I blog every week and I've written a couple business books. Um, and so I'm, I write curriculum because I train. So I more, was more of a technical writer. Well, when I came back from Guatemala, I, I wrote, I don't know, maybe five or six chapters of this book as part of my work there. And I didn't even know if I still kept it. So anyway, one day I'm doing self-hypnosis and I get this urge. It's we're in lockdown. I've had to close my practice, at least temporarily, I was trying to figure out how I could shift it online and still make a living. <laughs> how and do you hypnotize online? I know. Well, oh yeah. Well, you close your eyes. Yeah, you could be anywhere. It doesn't matter. The, okay. There's no difference. Online okay, because I don't know right about now. hypnosis. So okay. Yeah. yeah. So so anyway, I um I don't know. I just get this inspiration, and I thought, gee, I wonder if I have those chapters. So I went and looked them up, and I had written about five or six, and it, they just really were. It was bad. <laughs> but I just I just thought, okay. I don't know. I have this inspiration to write. And so I just kind of put myself into a trance and I literally Lauren, it just, it just came. The characters came, the idea came, the book came. And so I would get up every day. And if I was inspired to write, I would write, um, you know, I do my little 15 minute hypnosis in the morning and some days it would just be there and I couldn't stop. And I might go two or three days just writing, writing, writing. And every time I would sit down at the computer, I'd be like, oh, gosh, I wonder what's going to happen today. Because I, <laughs> I honestly didn't know. It's like so unconventional, right? So about so that you time, were writing by your pants. You weren't writing. You yeah, didn't have an no, outline. I just wouldn't let the story come. Came to you. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, yeah, it just came and this story emerged. And so about that same time too, looking for things to do during COVID, yeah. um, I joined Masterclass. I joined masterclass.com. And so uh, David Baldacci, who's probably my favorite writer in that genre. Oh, I love him. Yeah. He gave a class, Patterson, um, Dan Brown, Judy Bloom, and I can't remember who the, there were five authors. So I took all their classes and I learned a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, realized that my process wasn't anything like theirs. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was all good. And, um, you know, I started editing it and then... Um, I, I sent it to a friend who belonged to a book club and this book club had been together for like 10 years. And she's like, Oh, let me read what you're writing. And so she read it and she said, I want to take this to my book club. Can I, can I do that? And I'm like, well, it's pretty rough. And she's like, I think it's great. So, um, I had a, I went to one of their meetings. They all read the book. They loved it. And they really pushed me like, you need to publish this. And I'm like, look, there's a million of these books out there. I'm getting older. I'm kind of late in the game. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I just, I don't know. They just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And so as fate would have it, I believe there's no coincidences. I get this spam mail from a company called Publishizer and they're uh, like a crowdsourcing for uh, authors. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, this works. You got 30 days. And based on the number of pre-orders you get, they will connect you with different levels of publishers, right? Okay. So okay. I, I had like 250 pre-orders in, in 30 days, which I was really disappointed in because the goal that they said would be 500. So I was only halfway there. Well, I later found out from talking to the publishers, there were nine of them that they exposed me to, um, that that was really good because Publishizer doesn't do a lot of um, uh, fiction. It's mostly oh, nonfiction. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they felt 250 pre-orders was really good. And so I narrowed it down to three companies, three hybrid companies that I liked. Um, one of them, I really, it, it was it was my first choice. But they were so, they were hybrid and they were so expensive. And uh, I just kept saying to them, look, I'm a businesswoman. This is going to be my seventh business, right? And I don't see how I could ever even break even and pay you the fees that you want, right? If you're telling mm -hmm. me that, you know, an author, maybe if they're lucky, will sell 2000 books. And so I said, this doesn't make any economic sense to me. And of course they gave me, well, this is art. And I'm like, oh, well, art is great. Like, I'm really proud of what I created, but I'm not going to take all this money and give it to you and just say, oh, well, I'll just throw this away because it's art. <laughs> I'm, a better, I'm a better business person than that. Um, but they gave me a lot of feedback on my book on how it could be improved. Um, I, I really have a lot of respect for this company. And what made me decide to publish was they said they only took about 5% of the books that were submitted. Mm -hmm. um, they had a really rigorous process, even like seven different people read my book before they would decide if they'd make me an offer, which they did. And so I felt that was really good. I ended up with Mascot because... At the time, they were getting ready to create subplot, mm -hmm. which is a new division of theirs. Yeah, and yeah, I saw that. Whenever they called, yeah, yeah. And, and Jessica, just she's the acquisition director there. Uh, it was kind of her baby, and I was really excited about working with her. I felt like I could have a relationship with them, mm -hmm. and so ultimately, I went with Mascot. Um, though I also really liked a woman in New York, and she just was gung-ho and then just disappeared so I, that made that decision easy oh, maybe she got um, mugged <laughs> yeah, I don't know maybe so um but you know or as mystery writers you say maybe she's dead <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, you think it's just been a huge journey so it's a learning yeah. curve and I did it through COVID which was horrible um, you know, the paper shortage, the price went up of the books and like, you know, everybody got sick and they lost people. And it just was a very challenging time to go through this for the first time. Um, but I'm still standing <laughs> <laughs> and the book is real. Um, so yeah, it, my journey, I think has been very different than a lot of people's journey. Um, I'm going to do it again.
But you know, the writing is one thing. The writing goes pretty, at least for me, it went pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Like I probably wrote this book really in just a few weeks. It was the edit. <laughs> that now, now you had said that you you hip you would hip you do hypnotherapy or I, I, how how does hypnosis. that work to make you make you write or were you like getting yourself into the character Lori or how how you how know, you know self hypnosis is you know it's kind of a a meditative state um, where you're just open to suggestions it's a highly focused and a, a heightened sense of awareness. And so um, a big difference between that and say meditation would be you go into it with a goal in mind. Mm. And so, you know, for me, it was about inspiration. And I've been, I've been a hypnotist. I'm a board certified hypnotist. I, I do a lot of clinical kind of things like work with pain management and people with issues. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I'm really good at what I do and really good at hypnosis because I've been practicing it for 10 years. And so, you know, my subconscious mind knows when I ask for something, it responds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so I just made that my writing practice. I just do my meditation. And again, if I felt inspired to write, I'd go right to the computer. And then sometimes I just wouldn't stop. Like it was just like, oh, wow, this is great. Or I'd get up in the morning and it was like, oh, if there's something there again, I'm just going to go do it. Right. And mm -hmm. then there were days where it's like, no, nope, there's nothing today. Not, no, nothing here. Um, it, it's the editing for me, you know, the really, my goal when I write is to get it down, to get the mm -hmm. story down. Right. Yeah. And see where it leads me. And, and literally I never knew from one day to the next, it was just like, oh, wow. I wonder what's going to happen next. <laughs> <laughs> And, and yeah, and maybe I should make this decision. And yeah, I'm going to make that decision. And some of the decisions that I made, some of my readers are not very happy with me about. Um, so, you know, but what that tells me is that they're very invested in the book and they didn't yes. like the turn that I took. Right. Um, and that's good. That's a good thing. And so. Um, people are loving the characters. I fell in love with the characters. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them unexpectedly, uh, especially by the end of the second book. I, I never, you know, you hear authors say that. I've heard authors say that a lot. Like, I just, mm -hmm. I love my characters. I think about my characters, talk to my characters. Um, I understand what they mean now. Uh, how you yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I have a writing buddy, um, C.S. McDonald, and she and I have had these conversations that, whenever I get into the zone and I have some plots happening in my book, I, I got to get through that whole section. And if I get yeah. interrupted, it's very frustrating. Like, you know, yeah, my husband's husband hungry and I need to go cook dinner, but I'm in the middle of a gunfight, you know, but, yeah. but she has said, she's, we've had this conversation. She said, I'll let my characters bleed out for weeks and go on vacation. <laughs> and she says, well, they're not real people. No, no, they're not. But I think that the idea of them is fascinating. And what I've really enjoyed is in the first book, the characters all have a tremendous amount of growth because they're all put in a situation that no one would ever dream that they were in. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't fold, but they get close to it. Right. Like it's yeah. just it's extremely stressful. And so, um, you know, but they make it through. And then, you know, in the second book, it's really interesting because I had always planned on the, the women being the focus. And yet when I started writing the second book, I found myself because I loved all of the characters so much wanting to, them to have equal time right? Like I, I wanted them all to grow. I wanted them to evolve and to become who they were meant to be. Um, but that meant sharing the screen, so to speak with them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting because the third, the idea for the third book is in my head and it will actually have a hypnotist in it. I've decided to write about it. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be really cool. I cannot wait to get this story on paper, um, but I'm disciplining myself to wait until I'm done editing the second one. Um, so 
I, I think it's going to take a turn with who my favorite character is in the book and the third one. Um, like I just, now, did you put remember. any of yourself into these two women or did you, um, were they, well, my love, my love for red wine is definitely in the book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cause Lori's always having a Pinot Noir or some kind of um, a Merlot or a cab. Right. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's a little bit of me in all of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you write about what you know, right? Yes. To some degree. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, there's one instance in the book that actually happened to me. Um, there's a, a place, it's, it's not a spoiler, but uh, something happens to Lori's dad. And it wasn't my dad that it happened to, but I was at a friend's house and this event actually happened. And the mom said, I think you need to go home now. Um, cause she knew what was coming. And so, um, you know, that was taken from real life. There are things in there that I think, um, you know, the wall of pictures that Jack had in his office, that was my ex's office, right? Mm -hmm. There are little pieces of that and probably of me throughout. I, I, you know, as I reread the book and continue to write with the characters, I see more of myself at times reflected in them, but none of them are really me. You know, I'm probably a combination of all of them, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so, yeah, but I feel like they all have their their own story. Um, the cop, Abernathy, in, in the book, um, you know, my I, I have family members that are cops, right? And so some of that is what I witnessed or what I've seen or, you know, pieces of people that I know from that possession, that uh, profession that are in him. Um, so, yeah, but I think the characters themselves are just who they are. Um, but I love them. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how long I'll go yeah. on. You know, I know Baldacci likes series. He does series. And, yeah. you know, some of them have I've liked more than others. And I think it's how you identify with the characters. You know, uh, one of his series in particular, I just, I just couldn't get attached to those characters. And so I read them all, but it wasn't as exciting for me. And I think that's the key. Like if you don't, if your characters are not um, relatable to the audience, they don't have to be likable. Right. Like yeah, I, I find they have to be likable. If I get to the point that I don't really care about, like, you know, like at a certain point in a book, if I'm like, I really don't care what happens to any of these people, then I end up not finishing the book, you know? Right. So, right. you know, and so I find I do have to like them you know but but then I know well, what you I, mean you, but you get invested in them or yeah you get invested and so what I mean by not being likable is that you can get invested in the bad guy like wondering like what's really making this guy tick so I don't necessarily like him because he's a bad guy but I find him interesting right mm -hmm. um you know I might want to know a little bit more about what makes him tick or I'm just excited to see him killed or go to jail or whatever right <laughs> um, but but again you're investing in the characters and I think that when when these characters kind of run their course um and I know there's at least three books of them um you know, I'm just going to see it, it'll be dependent on how I feel about continuing to write about them. Have they have, you know, they they live their purpose. Is there no more room for growth for them? Is there nothing much more interesting that they can do or say Then I might pull the plug or maybe my readers will pull the plug. Right. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. That yeah. I will hopefully get feedback that say, okay, enough of these guys, let's move on to something else. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but I, I know I, 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 even at my advanced stage, um, <laughs> I, I've got these three books, right. I, yeah. what, what comes after that? I have no idea. Um, Did you find it easier saying. writing the second book? after having written the first one? Oh yeah. What did you oh, learn? Oh. What did you learn from writing the first book that you used in writing the second book? I and think, um, you know, I'm, first of all, I'm really happy with my first book. I think, mm -hmm. 
I think for a first book, for a brand new author, I think it's a really good good book. And, and that's the feedback I've been getting. I look at that book. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, I think. Although some people say, oh, wow, there were so many twists and turns. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really see it that way. Um, I thought there were natural progressions, but then, you know, writing and it's so subjective from the reader's perspective. So mm -hmm. I just have to, everybody experiences it differently, uh, like anything. And so the second book, the story is much more complex. Um, mm -hmm. The the plot is a little bit more challenging. Like I, I intentionally put a lot of twists and turns in there. Um, it was more challenging for me to give my favorite characters airtime and to bring other things in that I didn't have in the first book. Mm -hmm. um, so the second book involves the triad and the mafia, which right there is culture things. Right? Yeah. Um, I also made decisions in the second book that are different than the first. Like in the first book, I didn't really use any swear words or anything like that. Um, you know, there's a budding romance. Some people have said in the first book, I didn't really plan for that to be the case. It's not a romance novel, um, <laughs> but people are asking, well, what happens to them, right? Is it what's going to happen in the second book? And so I'm not saying, um, <laughs> but, but, no, you, but you because of the, right. So, you know, in my, in my editing process, like the story's written, right. It has a beginning. I mean, the story is there. Um, and I'm really happy with the story. Um, I'm in the process now of going back and building out the story, the scenes, the characters, how am I going to reflect all of that? Um, that's what I call like the real crux of the writing. Mm -hmm. And I think I am much better this time than the first time. I'm including more dialogue this time, which is really challenging. Um, in this book, just because of the nature of the people involved, if I didn't have swear words in there, it just wouldn't be authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about yeah. the mafia and the triad, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and so what I chose to do is there's a lot of swearing in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had to Google a lot of swear words in Italian, right? <laughs> Um, cause for me, it was a little bit easier that way, um, than putting all those swear words in. I'm not prudish or, and I, I dropped my share of the F-bombs, but you know, I, I also, um, I just didn't, I'm not ready to totally write that kind of a book yet. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, the second book, I can see my growth as an author. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm excited about that. Like I, I uh, when's really the excited. second book coming out? Coming out when um, you... I'm editing it now, probably this time next year. I'd like to oh, have it out for the holiday season again. So my goal is I do two edits. Um, this time I got Grammarly because, quite honestly, I am comma impaired. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot figure out. I know it should be here. And Grammarly says no, no comma necessary. So yeah, no, I'm I'm comma impaired. Um, so that that technical editing should be a little bit easier for the publisher next time around. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I do two edits. So I do the the really hard edit first, and then I just have to walk away from it for a little while. Because yeah, that while, that's that that's what a lot of authors have to do because then yeah, it's just, fresh again. Because yeah, and then I just sit you down and start to see them. your own mistakes yeah. and yeah. Uh, well, and that was the thing. The second in the first book, it was so funny. I was laughing with somebody about this the other day. They were asking about my process and I was talking about editing. And I said, you know, I I went through the second edit. So like, I'm pretty much done with this book. Now that second edit is just grammar. Have I been a little too repetitive with words or whatever? Um, and I realized that... I haven't solved one of the big mysteries. Ah, loose end. I did it in my head. Like in mm. my head, I wrote it. Yeah. And when I went back and read the book after that fresh eye period, yeah. right? I was like, that's when you notice it. <laughs> how did the NSA ever get onto them? Like how, like real, it's like, oh my God, my reader. And it was terrible because 
Now I couldn't figure out how to work that in without major structural changes to my book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, that was really challenging for me. <laughs> I did not make caught that it mistake. before it was released. You caught it before. Oh God! Thank God! Yes. Yeah. And that concludes this episode of Authors on iTours. If you enjoyed this episode, then do give us a like and a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe so that you can receive notifications for upcoming episodes of Authors on iTours. In the meantime, happy reading.